In the early 1970s, these photographs of the Loch Ness Monster caused a media sensation. But the man who took them, Frank Searle, has been missing for over 20 years. All I'd discovered up in Scotland was that Frank Searle had been in the army, had worked as a greengrocer, and was originally from London's East End. If I could only find his birth certificate, I might be able to discover more. But none of the Frank Searles born in the whole of London were him. One of the newspaper articles I came across led me away from Scotland to Leamington Spa and a retired school teacher named Alan Jones. I think the first time I met Frank Searle was in 72. It was the result of me seeing a television programme about the Loch Ness Monster. And at the time, I had a group of children in school who were just about to leave. The following morning, I went into school and spoke to them about this programme. The response, almost straight away, was, let's do that. Let's go. And it was outrageous. I mean, it was an outrageous thought. In a very, very short time, we put together an expedition. <laughs> Back in the 1970s, the public were mad about Nessie. Frank Searle published new photographs in the press at regular intervals. Wanting to believe in the monster, people flocked to the loch. We drew into the car park at the front of the Foyers Hotel, which has a very high, dramatic view of the loch. And of course, it's breathtaking and you recognize you're in the, in the presence of a, a rather special place. So their excitement was, uh, was unbridled, really. And we arrived and saw just what we were about to undertake. Usually the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau would be the first port of call for aspiring monster hunters. But now there was a clamor to visit the other side of the loch, to meet the increasingly famous Frank Searle. When I first met Frank Searle, I thought, my initial reaction was that I thought he was absolutely crackers. Uh, he'd been up there in all kinds of weather at all times. But then he was a very disarming fellow, a ready cockney smile and a, a ready cockney word, which seemed to me to be an indication that he was a, a genuine fellow who was trying to search for something that he believed to be true. And the kids, I think, were very impressed with his whole approach to, to living there. I think some of them, especially, it was very strange, some of the girls uh, found it quite romantic, I think, the idea of, of being by the lock side 24 hours a day. 15-year-old schoolgirl Joyce Katanach met Frank Searle whilst on holiday with her parents. I saw this kind of striking-looking rugged chap with his Clark Gable moustache and his rugged features, outdoor, weather-beaten, brown man. He told me that he had professional monster hunter written on his passport. Frank was so much his own man that nobody could tell him to do anything. He was just a, a great individual man. He didn't want financial gain. He just wanted to find out what was there, if anything. Every summer, Alan Jones would return to Loch Ness with his pupils. When they got back to the classroom, they received Frank's regular newsletters, informing them of his latest sightings of the monster. He even sent them exclusive photographs of Nessie before he offered them to the press. This one here shows the single hump and the top of the head of a, of a creature. Well, the children's reaction to Frank Searle's photographs were that they had to be what they said they were because Frank Searle had been kind to them in the past and therefore they would have no reason to think that the information wasn't absolutely valid. So they were excited at the prospect that these were photographs that no one else had seen, that they were seeing before anyone else. Whilst the newspapers published his photographs, the other monster hunters at the loch were increasingly frustrated by Frank. 
he was still refusing the investigation bureau access to his photographs and negatives. But by 1973, Frank had no need to worry about his critics. With little to show, after a decade of searching, the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau disbanded. Once the LNI had ceased its uh, surface watching, then the number of people looking at the lock was uh, back to what it had been before, which is really the local people and uh, one other, Frank Searle. The Loch Ness Investigation Bureau may have deserted the loch, but on the south side, there is Frank Searle. Frank was now such a celebrity that he frequently appeared on radio and television as the resident expert on the Loch Ness Monster. I'd uh, gone into all the evidence, talked to local people who'd had sightings uh, and so on, sorted out the wheat from the chaff because there's been a lot of rubbish written about Loch Ness. Uh, but, uh, I find that the evidence was uh, absolutely overwhelming. Uh, I wondered why no one had ever taken uh, a clear picture. I always carry a cine camera when I'm out in the boat. If one of the beasties pops up 40 or 50 yards from the boat, then I should grab the cine uh, and this will be the jackpot. Sustained public interest in Frank's quest meant he could upgrade from his tent by the shore to a more permanent caravan nearer the main road. Here he had the space to build his own visitor centre, but Frank found himself inundated with tourists who lost invaluable time in his hunt for the monster. He always used to have, I remember seeing it on the side of his caravan, there was a little sign that said, Girl, Fri Girl Friday required apply within. And, yeah, apparently you got quite a few takers of people that wanted to be Girl Friday. Or, you know, he certainly had these girlfriends, absolutely no doubt about that. And uh, I saw more than one of them, uh, and they seemed to be quite happy staying in Frank's caravan with him and sitting there looking for the monster with him. And he always wanted to be in between nine o'clock and ten o'clock in the morning for the sake of his visitors arriving. No, his fans, he called them. His fans, was it? Oh, yes, I. And then, of course, he had that woman stayed with him for a while too, hadn't he? He had Girl Friday for a while. In fact, I think he had two Girl Fridays at one stage. Oh, I believe you're right. That's right in that van. But he didn't have them at the doors when he could have done with them. When he was living in the cold tent. No. I decided to find out if these Girl Fridays really existed. In one of Frank's newsletters, I came across Leva Petten, a monster huntress who'd been at the loch in the 1970s. Perhaps she would know more about Frank. I traced her back to her native Belgium. I've always been interested in strange phenomena. The Loch Ness Investigation Centre, it was full of newspaper articles, obviously Frank's photos, and we were really amazed. And that's when I volunteered. I never liked the term Girl Friday because it's more mindful of household tasks and all that, so... Assistant sounded better. He was in his 50s and I was 24 or something at the time, so... I was young then. He wasn't handsome or dashing, not outstanding in any way. Uh, he was also very opinionated. Uh, yeah, this British are the best in the world. Men are better than women. But I think part of it was a bit of a front, you know, a bit of a showman. I was living with Frank as uh, his mate. Uh, there was no romantic involvement, never was, not for him, not for me, but we were involved physically. It sounds harsh, perhaps, but that was the 70s, people experimented. And there was no AIDS back then, so I, it wasn't anything wrong back then, not to us. As well as keeping a diary and writing a newsletter to his fans, Frank harboured greater literary aspirations. He wrote a book, and in 1976 he found a publisher. The blurb described Frank as having become almost as much of an institution as Nessie itself. 
Frank was at the peak of his fame, but the publication of the book would prove to be the start of his downfall. I bought a copy of Frank Searle's book and uh, the weather was very poor, so I, I sat in the tent in the rain reading through the book and was interested to, to see what uh, his descriptions were of recent events, which I might not have been familiar with. And uh, at one stage, I started to read a piece on the fossil record, which seemed very much out of place with the rest of the book. The rest of the book had been a very folky kind of book. Uh, and all of a sudden it started to be quite serious and using words di which didn't seem to match the language of the rest of the book. And I had this extraordinary thought that I'd read all this before. And I found, I think there are 1,400 words which are precisely the words that I'd written two years before reproduced in this new book. And I just, at that stage, my heart sank. You know, a lot of the trust that I'd given just seemed to sort of ooze away. It was a case of plagiarism. Alan Jones's lawyers threatened to sue Frank's publishers and the book was withdrawn from the shelves. Um, I had returned all the favours that he had done for me and the kids, and that this was um, a betrayal of, of that uh, friendship. I had no communication with him whatsoever during that period or since. Frank refused to let this get in the way of his monster hunt, but there was a new threat on the horizon. By now, a new generation of hunters had appeared at the loch. Adrian Shine was an amateur naturalist who set out to continue the work of the disbanded investigation bureau with his own Loch Ness project. Where the bureau had failed with cameras, Shine hoped to succeed underwater with sonar. Our whole effort was put into these sonar patrols. We were rather irreverent by the standards of the 1960s in our approach to the subject. For us, it was a question of just seeing, we'd already got back to the position of trying to see whether there's anything there at all. Um, to our surprise, there was. There were contacts we didn't understand. Like his predecessors, Shine was also suspicious of Frank Searle. I have to admit that as far as Frank Searle is concerned, he was well known in the trade as, as a bad hat. Yeah. There was a collision between what had been the norm, which were fairly organized attempts to slowly investigate Loch Ness and an individual, uh, an individual's attempt to produce a status for himself fraudulently based and who had an antagonism towards what he, he might have seen as something bigger or in some respects better. I hope we were better. The race was on in a renewed effort to find the monster. Adrian Shine and his team were on a collision course with Frank Searle. But this wasn't the 60s anymore. There would be no pretense at cooperation from either side. The loch would soon resemble a battlefield. 